Good morning. Welcome to Worship with Middle Spring Presbyterian Church. It's a joy to be with all of you. Almost all of you are online with us this morning as Middle Spring's session uh, has made the decision that we will be worshiping virtually only again for a time. Uh, we do have those of us who are leading worship here today with us in the space, and so I'm grateful for all of you who are here helping to lead worship. Let's take this time to quiet our hearts and minds in preparation for worship. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Welcome to worship with Middle Spring Presbyterian Church on this third Sunday of Advent. Today, our theme for Advent is joy. So we will be thinking about the places and times in our lives where we are called to sow joy. Uh, we begin with the Advent candle lighting, and so I turn it over to our candle lighters. Oh, actually, I'm praying first. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me pray first. Let's pray together. O oh God who sows joy, you call us from the exile of our sin with the good news of restoration. You build a highway through the wilderness. You come to us and bring us home. Comfort and challenge us with the expectation of your saving power made known to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we join in our candle lighting. Please join in. I dream of dance parties in the kitchen and of laughter that is contagious. I dream of tender words of wildflowers and front porch swings. I dream of every little thing that brings joy, no matter where it's found, and I know it comes from God. Of peace. And today we light the candle of joy. 
And we remember that God's dreams for this world take root in our tears. God's dreams for this world involve a joy that stirs within and overflows and is contagious. So may this fire burn bright and stir. May we dance, may we laugh, may we love. May we sow joy in a hurting world, and may it be a holy act. Amen. Hear these words from Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Friends, old habits and new wrongs wear ruts in our lives and relationships. We forget the great things the Lord has done for us and cease to tend to the repentance that prepares the way for hope and peace and joy in our lives, the way of the Lord. Acknowledging together our need of repentance and grace, we pray together. O great writer, with a sky full of stars and a world full of flowers, there should be no end to my joy. And yet, instead of decorating my very being with joy, I let it slip away like loose change. Instead of singing like Mary, 
or laughing with the psalmist, all I can sometimes see is the desolate nature of the wilderness we walk. Forgive me. Teach me the ways of children who laugh and dance and sing as if joy is the very thing that keeps them alive. Amen. Sisters and brothers, hear the good news. The Lord has done great things for us. God is able to restore us. Like the water coursing through a desert, the waters of baptism course through our lives, bringing, reminding us that we belong to God and that the Holy Spirit is at work in us and in the world. Live in obedience to the one who was and is and will be forever, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let us trust that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. That brings us to our time with children. And so Luna and I talked a little bit this morning about the uh, Jesus Mother Mary. So let's go hear what we were talking about this morning with Luna. Good morning. This morning we are going to talk about Jesus' mother, Mary. Luna heard that I was going to talk about Mary and she decided she wanted to dress up as Mary. I don't know if that's appropriate or not, but I, uh, I indulged her this morning. Often when we think about Mary, we think about a, a very shy, very quiet young girl who uh, was very obedient and she was and and maybe only ever did exactly what she was told by her parents as well and, and was known in the town as being someone who uh, always wanted to just be nice and kind and compassionate and, and and all of that may well be true we just don't know a lot about Mary I have some nativity sets here that I wanted to show you uh, what Mary looks like in all of the different ones so this nativity set right here is from Peru and right here is Mary in that, and you can see that she is kneeling down next to Jesus and she's in prayer. And this one up here is one that was in my house when I was growing up. I actually think my father made it. That's what I understand. And again, you can see that Mary is very peaceful and very quiet. This one down here is one from Mexico, and this figure right here is Mary. And she is standing with Joseph and the angel and shepherds and wise men, as we have in most nativity scenes. And this one, last one right here, this one is from Guatemala. And what I think is really interesting is we're not really sure which of these figures is Mary. It could be this one or it could be this one. And this one is holding bread. And Mary certainly was someone who took care of baby Jesus and, and adult Jesus. Or this one could be Mary, and I like I like to think of this one as Mary. Mary was maybe holding a, a staff, a walking staff, but ready to go and ready for whatever was needed to answer God's call. And in the end, what I want to share with you is, again, we don't know a lot about Jesus' mother, Mary. We don't know uh, what she looked like. We don't know uh, what she acted like on a, on a daily basis. But we do know from a speech that she uh, that is in the Gospel of Luke, which we're going to read in worship in a little bit, we do know that she understood who God was, that she understood that God was merciful and compassionate and had a heart for poor people. And I believe that she taught that same mercy and compassion uh, and uh, loving nature for the poor and the vulnerable, those who were weak and could not fend for themselves to her son, Jesus. And so we can learn from Jesus what God is like, and we can also learn a little bit from Mary about what God was like as we listen to her speech later. So I invite you to listen to that when I read it before uh, during the sermon. And also just to remember that we don't know what Mary was like, but we know that she was obedient to God and courageous and merciful, and she also had a heart for the poor. So we can seek today to be like Mary a little bit in our lives too. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for 
Jesus' mother Mary today. We are grateful for all that she gave to him as she raised him from a baby into an adult. We're grateful for her obedience to you. So help us also be your obedient people like Mary. She said, let it be with me according to your will. And so may that be our prayer also. Let it be with us whatever you want for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for listening so nicely. In preparation for hearing God's word a second time, let us join together in prayer. Creator God, scripture is flooded with dreamlike images. The lion lying down with the lamb, justice rolling like a mighty river, swords being beaten into plowshares, the prisoner being set free, good news to the oppressed, the whole world rejoicing. To our human ears, there are times when these words can sound like nothing more than a far-off dream, downplaying prophecy to fantasy. However, what we know is that to dream is to hope, and to hope is to imagine, and to imagine is to wonder, and to wonder is to believe, and to believe is to live and breathe for your promised day. So give us the strength to listen as we dream, O oh God. For deep down, we know your words are the very thing we need. Amen. The first text I'm going to read to you this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. We'll be taking a look at Luke's text later during the sermon. Hear now this word from the prophet Isaiah. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue to think about the posture of dreamers, to reflect on what it looks like to be dreamers especially in this Advent time when we refocus ourselves on dreaming and longing for God's promised future. To be dreamers is to watch for God, for what God is doing in us and in the world, and to have hope in what God is doing. To be dreamers is to prepare the way of the Lord by preparing our hearts to live in the promised peace of God. Today we reflect on dreamers are those who sow joy, sow as O-W, joy. People who sow joy are people who dream. In our text, though, there are and continue to be, have been and continue to be, a lot of images of wilderness, of barren places of forest wasteland, well, not forest wastelands, but of forests that are difficult to navigate. The wilderness does have great significance for the people of Israel and also for Jesus and his people in their time. Wilderness is still a metaphor that we use today when we are in either physical or emotional places of feeling lost or alone, or forsaken, or broken. So how do we hold together those two pictures of wilderness and sowing joy today? I want to make the case that the wilderness is not as barren a place as it might seem when we are in the midst of it. That the wilderness may be, that the wilderness is, the very place that we are called to sow joy. So we'll be thinking about 
how to do that today. Many of you like to look to nature to see God's work in the world and to help you understand who God is. And, and we can do that with the wilderness. We can look at different places that seem to us to be wildernesses and also see how much life there is in those places, which brings us great joy. If you think about a desert wasteland, so often we wonder how these very, very dry places, some of the deserts in the world get less than eight inches of rain in a single calendar year. How can those places be places where there is any life at all, where we can find joy? And yet we know that the plants that are in the desert hold gallons and gallons of water. I read this week that some cacti can hold up to something like 126 gallons of water in deserts here in the United States. It's seemingly barren, but there is life in those places. Plants and animals that through God's creation have learned and adapted and thrive in those desert wildernesses. Think too of forest fires. I think I've shared with you that on a trip Derek and I took to California, we went, this was many, many years ago, and went to a vineyard that had recently burned in a fire and how desolate it looked. And yet, in that desolation were the very seeds for new life. It happens in our pine forests with trees that are meant to drop their seeds with fire and the earth that is created through fire is exactly the fertile place that they need for new growth. That's not to discount the devastation of the fires of late. They do bring devastation, but within that, there is a place for fertility and a place for new growth and thus a place for joy. We can look to scripture too to see the different ways that God's people have responded to the wilderness. In the Exodus, the people were in the wilderness for 40 years, and it was a hard place. They complained often of not having the sustenance they needed immediately when they wanted it, the way they wanted it. They complained often of the difficulty and of how they did not feel led by God or provided for by God. And yet, God did provide, and more than that, the wilderness for the people of Israel was a place where they were shaped and molded for obedience, a place where they learn to be led by God and to trust God for what they need. When we get to Lent, we'll hear anew the story of Jesus being driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit immediately after his baptism. For Jesus, the wilderness was a place where he began or refined his understanding of who God is, of who he was, and what his mission was, and on whom he would rely to fulfill that mission. That all happened in those 40 days of testing in the wilderness. In Psalm 126 that I shared with you, that psalm is a post-exilic psalm. The people have returned to Israel after being in exile in Babylon, and they are remembering the ways that God provided for them in exile. It's turned into a hard time for them again in Israel. Scholars think that perhaps there is a drought at that time. And so the psalm begins with remembering the joy that they had even in a place of wilderness exile and moves to a plea, asking God again, restore our fortunes like the water courses in the Negev. They are able to hold together both the wilderness land and the possibility for joy. It's an affirmation. It is a song of faith and a song of trust in God that even in that dark place, there will be joy. For me, some of my most important learnings about who I am and even more importantly, who God is, have come in wilderness wandering. And I've shared a lot of those stories with you over the years. They were Times in my life when I, too, felt lost or alone or scared or broken. I have shared with you 
about the assurance I received after a melanoma diagnosis that no matter what, God would provide for my family and that God would provide for me. We had no idea in that moment what that looked like for the future, but we were able to trust anew in God and to be joyful even in that difficult moment. Sometimes the wilderness bears fruit, which is apparent immediately. Sometimes we have to spend reflecting back on the wilderness to see what has been sown there. Whether it was in the moment or in reflecting back, God's presence becomes apparent when we seek to be present to God. And so that's one way that we are able to sow joy, even in a difficult place, is by seeking to be present to the God who is always there with us. I would not trade those difficult times, because I believe the glory of the Lord was revealed not despite the difficulty, but precisely because of it. If we look at what the prophet Isaiah shared with us in Psalm 40, uh, not Psalm 40, in Isaiah 40, the cry is coming out of the wilderness. And when the glory of the Lord is revealed, the prophet is still in the wilderness. But the wilderness has been transformed by God's hand. So having eyes to see who God is when we are in the wilderness is part of how we sow joy. I do want to share with you Mary's speech from Luke's Gospel because I think that's a third indication of how we seek to show joy. Again, we don't really know too much about who Mary was, but we do know that she was a very young woman. We do know that in answering God's call, she was suddenly plunged into a wilderness place. She became an unwed pregnant teenager. We do know, well, we don't know. Scripture doesn't testify to us that Mary might have felt uncertain or scared at times. And I am certain that she was a person of incredible godlike character. But I also can't help believe that she went to see Elizabeth because she needed someone to journey with her and to help her understand what was going on with her and with God and what her role was in God's future. So Mary spent some time with Elizabeth and she testified to Elizabeth her understanding of what was going on. So here is Mary's song of praise. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. What I appreciate about Mary's Understanding of how God was using her and how we are used to sow joy even in the wilderness is that Mary understood that she was being used as an agent of God's redemption. Even in her place of wandering and wondering what was to be in store for her and for the child she would bear, she wanted to be an active part of what was going on with God and in God's kingdom. Her life would not get any easier after the child was born. People tell me all the time, well, 
people used to tell me when my children were little not to complain because it was only going to get harder. And as they have grown, I have recognized that that is correct. Because now the problems they face are not problems that I can solve. When they were little and they were hungry, I could feed them. Now the problems that they have are problems that they must work out for themselves with my support. Mary faced the same with Jesus. She watched him grow into an adult. She watched him confront the powers that were oppressing his people, her people. She watched him make a name for himself and a new understanding of God that would ultimately lead to his death on the cross. She spent his entire life, and probably longer, in the wilderness. And yet she was willing to do so and found great joy in doing so because she understood what was going on with God and in God's kingdom. I was privileged this week also to take part in another Honduras Partnership Conference call. And last week I asked you to be in prayer for our friends in Honduras, the church who was going out to offer relief from, hurricane, uh, from hurricanes Iota and Ada. And so on Thursday we had the opportunity to hear how it went. And when Alex Rodas began speaking about what had happened, he started with these exact words. A month ago, he said, we had a dream. We had a dream that we could be a part of God's healing in Honduras. We had a dream that we could feed a few people and bring some people some clothing. And he said, thanks to you and to the response of the church, that dream magnified and blossomed and they brought great joy to three different communities by sharing food and clothing and needed medical attention. The church in Honduras, from all of the different churches, and most of their churches are only 20 to 30 people, maybe more, but they gathered 70 people who were willing to commit over 24 hours of being awake, of driving, of tending to people, and of coming home again so that they could do it in a safe fashion. And it all started with a dream in the wilderness. I give thanks for the way that they sowed joy. And so part of our sowing joy in the wilderness, not just seeking joy for ourselves, but of being part of the joy for the rest of the world that God intends, is to see how we can be agents of God's, how we can be agents of redemption and vessels for God's love and compassion in the world. The wilderness is a really, really hard place to be, especially when we do not know when it will end. But perhaps we shouldn't be so quick to try and exit, so quick to dull the pain we have, because when we are present to God in the wilderness and asking how we can be used by God, that's when we are those who dream and who seek to sow joy, cooperating with God's desires for the world. May that desire and may joy be born in us anew this Advent season. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for all of those who have gone before us and all of those who today continue to witness to the possibility in you even when we are in dark places. Help us to be those who answer your call. Give us strength to sow joy in a weary world. Amen. Friends, we join now in a, res in a responsive affirmation of faith. I'll begin and then you'll join in at home. Or you can join in with the whole thing if you want. That's fine too. We affirm our faith together. Great Creator, we are in awe of you. We will never know how you managed to dream up mountains and valleys, freckles, dimples, and so many colors of skin. A cool morning missed the change of seasons or the magic of music. Your greatness is beyond our reckoning. And because we are in awe of you, we believe we must follow Mary's lead and allow our souls to sing. We believe that the appropriate reaction to your goodness is complete gratitude. 
which looks like love for our neighbor, justice for the poor, food for the hungry, and joy that overflows. And even though we do not always believe in ourselves, we believe that our song is pleasing to you. We believe. Help our unbelief. Amen. Friends, we continue at the church to receive your pledge cards and your uh, sharing of your financial gifts, your offerings, and we are grateful. Thank you for all of the ways that you continue to give and for the ways that you let us know how you plan to give next year so that our mission and ministry can, uh, can be assured and our session can make wise decisions. Thank you. You may still, of course, continue to send in both pledge cards and offerings, either directly to the church or to Gary Russell, or you may set up a recurring gift online or send your uh, one-time offerings as often as you like to. This is a time of year when the abundance of some and the needs of many often stand in marked contrast. So let us give generously here in the church and in our communities as well, of our gifts of time, our talents, and our financial resources. Amen. I'm going to come down below and we'll share prayer joys and concerns with you. Actually, yep. As we join together in prayer, I do have many joys and concerns to share. This morning, our church flowers are given by Richard and Dorina Saul to the glory of God and in celebration of their grandchildren. We give thanks for their beauty this morning. Today, we are holding the staff of the Presbytery of Carlisle in uh, our Presbytery prayers. We are also holding the Shippensburg Area School District Superintendent and teachers and students in prayer. And we are praying for Peña de Horeb Church in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. Peña de Horeb is the church which, with we, uh, which with we began our housing ministry. And they are one of the churches in the Presbytery of Honduras that is the primary center for a lot of the activity that happens in the Presbytery. So we are grateful for Alex and Pastor Juan and all of the Presbyterian women in Honduras in general, but in, in Peña de Horeb specifically this morning other joys to share with you, and please feel free to leave your own joys or concerns in the comments at any time so that we may share them this morning. Please know that Troy Porter is home, and we are grateful for his being home from the hospital. We are grateful that uh, he is going to be receiving rehab of various kinds to get stronger after his uh, hospital stay, uh, but he was his leg was, did not have to be amputated, which was a very real concern at one point, and we are grateful that that did not have to happen and that he is home and healing. But please continue in prayer for his healing. Uh, I believe that Brian Bear is home as well. He was to come home on Friday, and I have not heard that that didn't happen, so we're grateful for Brian's healing and that he is home. Please also uh, know that Van, Harold Van Art, Van Art, Van as we call him, turned 90 this past week. And so uh, Van, I know you'll be watching this later. So we are grateful for you in the life of this congregation and grateful uh, for your birthday and look for another year of love and faith for you as well. Please also know that we sent, well, we, we the church, sent out the military boxes, and we're grateful to Richard and Dorena Saul and to everyone who gave uh, for the material items that went in those boxes for our military folks and money for postage. Thank you all for that effort, and to our deacons as well for continuing to sponsor that effort. Gus, are there any other joys in the comments? Uh, Deanna Bear is in the comments. She's confirming that Brian is home and also expresses gratitude for all of the prayers, calls, texts, and cards that they've received. Thanks be to God. We are grateful. Please hold these concerns in your hearts then. Continue in prayer for Dick Weller. What a roller coaster. Dick, you may even be watching, worshiping with us this morning. Um, if you received a prayer email from me on Friday, the news that we had to share at that point was not great. But then on Saturday, uh, Shirley had another email saying that they'd actually had two very, very good days for Dick, and uh, confusion was lessened or gone, and that doctors are hoping that he will be released from Hershey Hospital this week to head to Penn State uh, Rehab Center, Penn State Hershey Rehab. 
please continue to be in prayer for Dick for his healing and for Shirley for strength as she rides this roller coaster with him. Uh, we are grateful for this good news and Shirley is confident that it will continue. So Dick and Shirley, you remain in our prayers for both strength and for healing, of course. Please be in prayer for Jill and Jim's uh, granddaughter, Ryan. Ryan was hospitalized this week with some intestinal inflammation. They finally have a diagnosis and are treating her for that. And so she hopes to be released this coming week. It was possible for a parent to be in the hospital with Ryan. And so we're grateful uh, that, uh, that that could happen and grateful for healing. But please continue to pray for Ryan for healing. Deb Arnold has asked us to continue to be in prayer for her brother-in-law, Danny, and who went back into the hospital on Wednesday. So please continue to be in prayer for Danny. He's been in and out a few times after having been diagnosed with COVID. I was able to share with you earlier this week that uh, Susie McClay was doing better after having been diagnosed with COVID. I received word on Friday that she again took another downturn. So please be in prayer for Susie for healing from COVID. There are many, a few others in our congregation who have also been uh, diagnosed. And as you know, our country continues to diagnose somewhere in the neighborhood of 200,000 cases per day. So please be in prayer for all of those who've been diagnosed and their family members, especially those who are hospitalized and especially our healthcare workers as they work in just what are overwhelming conditions. Please be in prayer also for Don Kelso continuing. He's been in the hospital for quite some time. He's been on a ventilator for a few days and the family may well be facing very difficult choices about how to, how to move forward with doctors. Please pray for healing for Don for comfort for Jen and Rodney and all of Don's family who love him very much. Those are all the concerns that I have to share with you. Are there concerns in the comments? Jan Isle asks for prayers for Pastor Earl Barrick, who was diagnosed with COVID. He Lord has in your... ongoing pre-existing conditions that make it especially difficult for him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Debbie Fletcher asks for prayers for of prayers of strength for Susan Riggs and Brenda Pearson. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Please be in prayer too for those who have lost loved ones over the course of this year, especially as the holidays continue. It is a very difficult time for those who are missing people they love. So please be in prayer for them. Let's join together in prayer. God who restores, you have done great things for us and we rejoice. So often you have filled us with laughter, even turning tears into, of sadness into shouts of joy. You send prophets who point the way to justice and show the way to you. We thank you for sending good news to us and repairing so much that we have devastated. In this season of light, we lift up in prayer so many who wait in darkness. People oppressed by poverty and discrimination, by political upheaval or dangerous rulers. People imprisoned wrongly and also those imprisoned justly. God, right what is wrong among us and in us and restore us to you and to others, to ourselves. Make the brokenhearted whole again. Comfort those who mourn, repair our ruined cities. God, we lift up to you all of those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, the death of loved ones. We lift up to you all of those who are sick and suffering from COVID or the other illnesses that have not seeked to, to plague your people. We lift up to you the family members of those who are sick, especially when people are in hospital and unable to be visited. We pray for compassion and mercy for patients. We pray that you will uphold and strengthen our healthcare workers who are long fatigued. Enable them to find times of rest and respite. Enable us in this nation to move forward together in seeking to protect one another, in looking to the well-being of our neighbors so that the burden on our healthcare system may be eased. Enable us to make 
the difficult choices of sacrificing, things that we take for granted at the holidays, but that are not safe to do now, so that we may protect the well-being of our healthcare workers. God, we lift to you all of those that we carry in our hearts and minds, and we name them now, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. For these and for those known only to you, we ask your healing grace, and we ask that you enable us too to use our hands for your plan of healing and reconciliation and redemption. In all the jostling and jingling of these days, Lord, do not let us lose sight of you or those whom you especially came to serve. In all the difficulty and the heartache and the brokenness of these days, Lord, do not let us lose sight of you. You are the light of the world. Live among us always, full of grace and truth. We pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, just a few words for the week to send you out with. Hopefully you received your Advent devotional in your midweek email, and that will continue to come to you each week while we're in Advent. In our newsletter, there is information about our plans for Christmas Eve. They include an online-only service that will be made available as early as 9 a.m. in the morning on Christmas Eve day. It'll be on our Facebook page, on our YouTube channel, and also on our website. So we encourage you to access that service, to uh, worship in your homes, and if you, if you do plan to gather with family, it will be available to you for worship with your families. And also we have candles that you uh, can pick up at the church if you want, the candles that we use to pass the light uh, to and fro to and from one another in the sanctuary on Christmas Eve. So uh, you may take advantage of that by calling the church office and just letting us know you would like those. We will also, though we are not worshiping in person inside, we will be gathering on Christmas Eve at 8 p.m. in the parking lot, masked and socially distant, to sing together Silent Night and Joy to the World. We, we feel that we want to make that witness on that day in this world. So please plan to join us if you feel comfortable doing so and if you are able. Those are all the announcements that I have for you. Our sending hymn is Good Christian Friends Rejoice. It can be found in the Glory to God hymnal at about number 132 or in your blue hymnals at number 28. Let's stand in body and or spirit to sing God's praise.
Friends, you are God's called and sent people. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive one another. Above all, clothe all these things with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And as you go, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours this day and evermore. Amen.